Hey everybody, welcome to my Eurovision video. So Eurovision 2021 is over and I had an absolute blast reacting to the videos of Eurovision 2021 and as a result I've now got my Eurovision YouTube channel and I don't want this year to be like non-void before Eurovision 2022, right? So as promised, I did say that I was going to kind of post videos throughout the year, which means something to me, I guess. Um, because I know other Eurovision uh, reactors, I go down the route of um, reacting to a lot of Maniskin's material, which does naturally kind of get high volume of watches. Um, now, I have been listening to Maniskin, but I don't feel the need to react to them. Um, that's not my thing. So, we've just had um, LGBT month in June, and I really wanted to kind of do this video in June, and I just never got around to doing it. Um, work was really, really manic, really, really stressful. But I'm now on a few weeks holiday. Um, I'm in Sicily at the moment, and I kind of want to make sure I get back to my Eurovision channel and kind of post videos that are meaningful. So what I thought I'd do today is I would upload a video that goes through my kind of top 10 LGBT moments of Eurovision. And uh, I could do a kind of top 20, right? Um, there are so many kind of LGBT moments that are iconic and actually picking 10 was pretty tricky, um, but I did it. So let's start. So number 10 uh, has to go to Bilal Hassani, uh, who represent France in 2019 um, with Roy. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, now, I remember him winning the national final, and I remember him being really young. Um, what was he, 19? Um, but I remember aesthetically him looking very different. Um, I think I even had to Google kind of his gender, and I know we shouldn't have to do that. Um, and kind of found out more about him, the fact that he, you know, was brought up in a, in a Muslim household and had been pretty open about his sexuality for a long time. Um, and as a result of that, like before, during and after winning the ticket for France, he received a lot of, not just homophobic, racist abuse as well. Um, now, I think his performance was iconic. It opened it more, uh, up more than just kind of your sexuality. It was kind of just the message of the song what I gathered and from the performance was kind of love who you are because uh yeah what did he have he had the kind of deaf lady um and he had um the the girl who um did the the dancing and actually i watched a documentary about her on youtube actually and she has a medical condition which means that she is uh larger than the average size um and then he yeah what does he end with he ends with um yeah we are all queens so effectively um, it's it's a song with a powerful message of basically accept yourself. Um, I think the song was expected to do a lot better than it did. It got like 16th, right? But um, there are sometimes just in Eurovision where things that you see just mean a little bit more. And for me, that performance, that song, that message and him and what he had to say and what he had to bring that year um, was good, iconic. So yeah, number 10. Um, moving from number 10 to number nine, uh, moving from being unapologetically yourself, um, number nine goes to Sarah Alto, who represented Finland in 2018 with Monsters. Um, now, Sarah Alto, I was aware of a few years prior. She um, tried to represent Finland two or three years before um, with <laughs> the song escapes me now. Um, but regardless, and I fell in love with it, and I used to do these like Eurovision parties, and I used to invite my friends around, and I used to just reach out to Eurovision entries, national final entries, finalist entries, and entries from Eurovision, and ask them to kind of post like little videos that I would play to my friends before we kind of watched the show. And uh, I asked Sarah Alto to, to do one, um, and she did. And I was really, really happy about that. And I remember following her after that and then finding out that she had a female partner. And then she did The X Factor in the UK. And I followed her very closely throughout the show. And I just noticed that the sideline of her sexuality just was not a thing. 
and they never really brought it up until right at the end. It was either the semi-final or the final and we got um, a bit of backstory really and she was very open about her, her kind of sexuality and from X Factor she really was a kind of LGBTQ plus icon in the UK. She went around doing kind of gay prides and she did a lot for the movement in the UK. Um, I just can't comment on how she did in Finland. And then obviously with that high exposure, she got the ticket for, for Finland, right? Um, and uh, Monsters was, was my favorite um, out of all three songs. Um, and I just remember seeing the, the staging um, in the dress rehearsals and just loving the kind of, the nod to type kind of, <laughs> genderless aesthetics they like had deliberately made the dancers genderless um which i thought was was amazing i mean she is an out and proud uh lgbtq plus member um and you know and she took that with her to eurovision um, with the staging and just in her interviews. Um, the song didn't really do that well in the end. I think it came 25th. Um, but no, her her story coming up to Eurovision, her song that she chose that has some kind of LGBT, LGBTQ plus um, meanings behind it and the staging um, for me, yeah. Number nine, Sarah Alto. Number eight, um, I think, has to go to Monica and Vidas uh, from Lithuania 2015 with This Time. Now, the similarity between 10, 9 and 8 is actually, I also like the songs, but out of these 10, 9 and 8, this song I really, really, really like. So I liked the song before kind of I saw what they were going to do in the staging. Um, you know, I'm going to come to an uh, iconic... Uh, LGBTQ moment in 2014 <laughs> um, but this was 2015 and I think the winner of 2014 kind of gave a kind of queer ripple effect moving into the next year and, and Lithuania kind of held on to that. I don't think it was a, a ploy, I don't think it was a trick, it seemed genuine but part of their performance um, near the end uh, everyone on stage kisses so Monica and Vides kiss girl and boy and then the two female backing sing singers kiss and the two male backing uh, dancers, singers kiss. Um, yeah, LGBTQ plus rights and momentum in um, the Baltics isn't necessarily something that I am 100% aware of. I know little bits, particularly with Latvia that I've followed this year, um, but I'm sure that was pretty iconic for Lithuania um, of all countries to kind of have same-sex kissing as part of their staging. Um, but also, like I said, 2014 was a big deal um, for whoever won that year. <laughs> There's a train going by. Um, but for kind of young LGBTQ plus children, young adults, whatever you want to call them, watching Eurovision, seeing things like that, seeing things like that, same sex kissing is a big deal. Um, and yeah, it was a nice touch. And yeah, I thought it was good. It fe felt it fitted with the song and it fitted with the performance. And like I said, it didn't seem to be a ploy, a kind of gimmick. It did seem to be genuine. And yeah, I appreciated it. So yeah, that's number eight. Now, I think for me, like eight, nine, and ten could have been anywhere uh, in regards to eight could have been ten, whatever. But my top seven, like these were the top seven. Um, I, I, was, I was toying around with eight, nine, and ten, like bringing in people that now come out as LGBTQ plus who who've won, or kind of songs that are kind of LGBTQ plus anthems. Um, but no, one to seven means something to me. So number seven, <laughs> now it has to go to Paul Oscar, 1997, Iceland. Now, how old would I have been? 10, 11? 
uh, watching Eurovision. So I was watching Eurovision this year because this was the year that Katrina and the Waves won for the UK. And I do remember watching this performance and thinking, you're different. <laughs> you're different. And like, there are people that say like him and his performance, that song was ahead of its time. It really, really was. I don't know if anyone can remember it. Um, I'm sure people can. Like he was in leather, black leather. Um, it was very seductive. It was very sensual. Um, it wasn't leather, it was PVC, PVC. Um, he had eyeshadow. I mean, eyeshadow was all the rage, like 10 years later with like, yeah, vampire films and stuff bringing like, well, there's lots of other reasons why black under shadow eyeline things got popular. Um, but I do remember just watching it being like, and then this is a, again like so 1997 i'm 10 and 11 even in the uk there wasn't that much lgbtq plus representation on tv at all so i was sitting there thinking i think that this person is lgbtq plus um but i don't remember anyone saying it i don't remember our commentator saying it it does transpire that he was openly gay and the first ever openly gay contestant at eurovision um, and he continues to be, uh, according to my research, uh, he continues to be an LGBTQ plus activist in Iceland today. Um, it was, yeah, I can imagine seeing that performance then with very limited exposure to LGBTQ plus representation in the UK, particularly the other countries that must have led to some conversations. Um, in households, and there probably would have been people in households felt very uncomfortable by that performance, and he would have known that. And then still to choose to do that performance in 1997 is amazing. So um, I'll never forget that. I remember, yeah. And like I said, the importance of kind of young people growing up, seeing all kind of colours of the rainbow and having that represented um, is important. And I think that was one of my first... Uh, happens to be Eurovision, but one of my first kind of engagement with LGBTQ plus representation, Paul Oscar, Iceland, 1997. Came 20th out of 25, but um, yeah, well ahead of his time. Okay, number six. Um, now, this doesn't go down as like one of my favourite songs, but if we're talking about LGBTQ plus moments at Eurovision, the ones that really kind of ring true to me and the ones that really stand out are the ones that have ripple effects. Um, and for me, Krista Sigrid's Marry Me Finland 2013 kind of falls under that category. I wasn't totally crazy about the song. Um, but once I started kind of finding out more about her and then starting reading kind of the reactions to her performance, that's when it started to come a bit iconic to me. So sh I didn't clock until a year or two years ago that there is no gender in the song. There is no he, she. It is genderless, which is awesome. I know it, it is about or written about her and her partner who's now her husband basically saying marry me um why aren't you now why aren't you proposing but she was very clear that she wanted that the message of that song to mean more and push for um gay marriage in finland um now for me seeing some of the interviews on youtube where she talks about it i mean she goes down as kind of a genuine kind of lgbtq plus ally right she's not a member of the lgbtq club sorry club <laughs> but she is certainly an ally um and and i just love the fact that from that turkey decided that they were going to withdraw i think did hungary withdraw pretty quick afterwards and stating some things about the show getting a bit gay or whatever and i think somewhere in turkish or hungarian media reference was made to uh, Krista and her performance and at the end where she kisses a girl um, now whilst I would always want Turkey and Hungary to come back to Eurovision I, some of my kind of favorite songs come from both those countries um, you've got to kind of think to yourself so a broadcaster is saying that they're not going to take part in a contest that has gay kissing in 
Now, we're seeing a lot of stuff in the media at the moment with Hungary, so that's not surprising. With the recent laws that have been passed in Hungary where you're not allowed to teach or LGBTQ plus representation in schools is now banned. Um, and Turkey, there is obviously a conservative element of Turkey. There's a very liberal uh, element of Turkey as well, and liberal wing and people from Turkey, very liberal. And even in their politics, um, I mean, it saddens me that countries abandon ship uh, because of two females kissing. Um, but it is what it is, and you know, it kind of represents what, for me, who Eurovision is, and that is inclusivity. Um, and kind of the countries that participate, you know, people say, you know, Azerbaijan is in Europe. I mean, Azerbaijan, LGBTQ issues is another thing. If I take like Israel, okay, if I take kind of 30 of the of countries of Eurovision, one thing that binds us together is our movement towards the right path, in my opinion, when it comes to equality. So if Hungary and Turkey aren't there yet, then they're not there yet. Um, but I hope they will be. I hope there'll be a day in the future where seeing two girls kiss on TV doesn't mean a broadcaster decides to pull the plug on Eurovision. So yeah, number six. Okay, so for number five, I've kind of copped out a little bit. I um, have amalgamated a few and just put it under the umbrella of Eurovision 2021. Now, there are so many iconic LGBTQ I A plus. I I keep forgetting the new um, acronyms, the new the new acronym. So it's LGBTQIA plus. Yeah. <laughs> so um, firstly, like contestants, like um, there were members of the Icelandic team. Not Daffy himself. He's obviously married, but I think his sister. I think his sister who, it was iconic um, that she had the pansexual flag around her uh, during the results. So I think she might be. I know someone in uh, the Icelandic group, I can't remember the name of the group, I can only remember Daffy, um, are members of the LGBTQIA plus um, family. <laughs> uh, Django Macroy from the Netherlands, uh, Jendrik from Germany and just his song I Don't Feel Hate is a bit of a LGBTQIA plus anthem. Manitza from Russia. Now I was loving her before she even got uh, to Rotterdam. The BBC had covered the fact that she was getting a lot of hate inside her country for her liberal views but for me just normal views and one of them is her stance on LGBTQIA plus views. Now, for me, like, there are some Russian contestants that could have, in my opinion, with their high profile status in Russia, been a bit more vocal at Eurovision about maybe their support for that community. I know it must be very difficult for them leaving Russia and kind of saying those positive things because they might be in trouble, but Manitza did it. She's back in Russia and she's still releasing music. So it clearly is not against the law to show your support. So like Paulina, she's huge. Where was her? And the thing is, there are moments where past Russian entries have shown subtle solidarity. But for me, Manitza just showed, set the way for future Russian entries, just basically screw commercial success like just I don't know just do what, what what you feel right and you know there have been past Russian contestants who are very much allies and could have been more vocal um, in their support um, Leslie Roy from Ireland I know um, she has a female partner uh, Montaigne from Australia she identifies as bi Pretty sure this is correct. Um, Senate from San Marino. I know I've seen something a few years back where she had a female partner. Um, and obviously Maniskin. Like, I know Victoria identifies as bisexual. I know Ethan identifies as sexually free or sexually fluid, I guess. Which is what? 
I guess, pansexual, but I don't know, I don't want to give him a label. Um, and oh my gosh, that recent performance in Poland. Um, if you've watched any of my previous videos, you'll know that um, I am quarter Polish. So I do follow things inside Poland quite closely, particularly when it comes to LGBTQIA plus issues. And the fact that Manskin performed there, um, and uh, they decided to use their performance to make a political statement and embrace or have a gay kiss on stage, just to ruffle a few feathers in Poland. Um, but there were some lovely statements said with it. It wasn't about kind of doing a kind of F U to Poland or to Polish politics. It was just basically saying, feel free to love who you want to love, is basically what they were saying. Um, hopefully you can still hear me. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, I can't kind of stop uh, Eurovision 2021 without kind of giving a shout out to Nikki Tutorials. I mean, she was the first ever trans um, presenter. And I will say one of the highlights for me for Eurovision this year was her interviews that she did with each contestant. Like, she could easily have her own talk show. She was so genuine. She was so um, interested in the people that she was interviewing. And she just had a real easy flair to what she's doing like if she ever wants to leave her makeup tutorials and someone give her own show she should take that opportunity because she was very gifted I enjoyed that so yeah Eurovision 2021 for me uh goes into easy top five LGBTQIA plus <laughs> moments um that means something to me I guess okay number four um this is probably quite high higher than I thought thought it would be if I was doing this two or three weeks ago but I don't know I've really reflected on this kind of top 10 and every time I kind of was reflecting this song kept on or this entry kept on getting bumped up um and for me number four is uh I can't speak Slovenian but it's Siestri Siestri um in 2002 who represents Slovenia in 2002 now I don't think this was the case but I um, I think I'm right in saying this. Michelle um, from RuPaul's Drag Race, Michelle Visage, she did something for the BBC, a small snippet, her top three kind of drag moments at Eurovision. And obviously she picked Conchita, Verka and DQ from Denmark, Verka from Ukraine and DQ from Denmark. Now, spoiler alert, drama queen DQ from Denmark and Verka from Ukraine aren't in my top 10. Um, you know, I thought um, DQ from from Denmark was awesome. Drama Queen, great song. Didn't pass the semis, shame. Um, and still follow D DQ on Facebook, actually. And Verka, I don't know much about Verka. Um, but I don't think it's particularly... I mean, yes, obviously it's a drag character. But I don't think... I, I think I've really struggled to find anything that... I can't remember Verka's real name, the man that... that, that puts Verka on, but I don't think that they've said anything to suggest they're an LGBTQI plus member for a start, but also an ally. It's a man that dresses in women's clothes and that's it. That's as far as it goes for entertainment purposes. A bit like um, in the UK, the Irish one, oh, what is it? Blimmin' Hell on the BBC. Um, oh, it'll come to me later. It's, it's a man that that is married to a woman and has lots of children they're also in Mrs Brown Boys this is a man that dresses in women clothes for entertainment and that's it he's not an, a member of the LGBTQIA plus uh, family and he's not an ally either and the same for me goes for Verka so that's not in my top 10 but Siestri is or Siesta let's go Siesta that sounds right now what was this 2002 so how old would I have been then 16 so a bit more aware of the world I guess but even 2002 this is how far we've moved on and obviously things like RuPaul's Drag Race has really helped because let's just make sure our labelling is right because Siesta is a drag band they're not trans and more importantly you google anything online because 2002 by the point the internet's happening and there's news there's one from the BBC that uses the word transvestite they are transvestites. Now that word has been rejected. I don't know why, but it must be 
for an obvious reason that when I hear it, I feel uncomfortable. I know that that word has meaning in regards to Rocky Horror Picture and stuff like that, but people have kind of dropped that full transvestite word. But this is a drag group, and I remember a bit like Paul Oscar in 1997 watching this being like, this is different. Like, mind you, in the UK, I know we had things like Dame Edna, um, we had Lily Savage, um, but these, these weren't going on to a singing contest representing their country um, to over 400 million, no, 200 million people. Um, there was something quite momentum in that three minutes when they were performing. Um, and just recent research, because obviously I was young then, um, it really was a big deal. It was, it almost like <laughs> shut down Slovenia. Like there was huge debates about in parliament, how it was seen as an embarrassment that their act that they were sending to Eurovision to represent Slovenia was this transvestite group. And it was just before Slovenia joined the EU and it was debated at the European Parliament as well because of the reaction inside Slovenia of this anti kind of right-wing reaction to this drag group going to Eurovision um, that, they, they, that it almost cost them their their European Union membership um, that my recent research has shown me um, so but regardless of that like, how amazing, like, 2002 to now, like, you know, we have Drag Race UK, you know, the the previous season there are three females that released a song that got into the top 40 singles, there's talk about them maybe representing the UK, like, from 2002 to now we've moved on massively, and I hope Slovenia has as well, I'm hoping that it wouldn't be so much of a shock now if Slovenia sent a drag group but at the time 2002 it was huge drama and like I said me in the UK in 2002 seeing a drag act in a kind of international singing competition even I kind of sat and kind of took note okay number three um and a lot of people will probably think based on kind of my justification from previous uh, the previous kind of four to ten, why this one's quite high. It just is. I don't know why. Uh, remember this, I mean, I'm sure if everyone kind of sits down and does their top LGBTQIA plus moments, we'll all have different top tens, right? And this is just mine. But um, for me, number three is um, Ryan O'Shaughnessy from Ireland um, in 2018 with his song Together. Now, I remember when I saw the music video for the first time. Um, I don't think I knew who Ryan was. I don't think he features in the music video. It is just those two dancers that actually get to Eurovision. They're walking the streets of Dublin um, and they're doing this, this, this kind of choreo. Um, and it's a really nice video. So there was kind of, from the moment the video drops, kind of a magnifying glass over Ryan to work out whether he would bring those ideas to the stage and he was very honest and said yeah now he um is an ally um he used that platform to really kind of say you know love he says at the end of his song doesn't he love is love um and you know he makes reference in a lot of kind of press and media about the fact that his intention ultimately was to help people see that love is just that, it's love. There's no difference whether it's between men and women, woman and woman, or a man or a man. It's important because not everyone is as liberal as the people at Eurovision are. That's pretty much what he was saying. So he was saying that that message still needed to be heard and it still needs to be transmitted to the different corners of the Eurovision map. Um, and by gosh, was he true? Like, I remember seeing comments on YouTube, on his performances, and people just really saying what they felt about it. He really did, um, there was a bit of drama that Ryan hyped up a little bit. I think he was making out that Russia wouldn't show his performance and what would Eurovision do, but Russia did show the performance, they didn't edit it. Um, 
Yeah, like he is a genuine ally. I can't say none of it. I can't say it was all PR. It certainly wasn't. It was genuine. But um, there was moments where I was like, okay, Ryan, rein it in a little bit. <laughs> Particularly his, his kind of use of his staging in press conferences to kind of make some digs at some countries to create some headlines, basically. Um, but regardless of that, the performance is beautiful. Um, the song is so-so, but when you kind of watch the performance and the staging, I remember, I'm really glad they toned it down a little bit. Um, I remember watching the first dress rehearsal and there was a lot of focus on him and the girl on the piano. And I was thinking, what? This, you, you, the video is just the two men dancing together. You've made it very clear that you want your entry to be a celebration of love, regardless of who's loving who. And so you've decided that your camera angles are gonna be just you and this random lady playing a piano who is effectively just a backing singer and you two in love. It was weird. But by the time it got to the actual kind of live performance in the semi-final, they toned that down a little bit. There was less focus on her, more focus on the dancers. Um, but that part of the staging always kind of confused me a little bit. Um, but I remember really rooting for that entry. I liked the song. The song was elevated by the performance. And, you know, we've gone through, you know, Russia doing the laws that they did. We were getting ripple effects in other countries where kind of prides want to be happening and they just keep getting kind of pushed aside. And it seemed like 2017, 2018, like we needed something like this, this visual reminder that love is love. Um, and I remember it coming at the right time. So I was really happy um, that Ryan brought the, the video to the stage. Um, yeah, it's a really um, memorable moment for me. That's why it's in my top three. So yeah. Now I'm sure if I got people to do this top 10 that my number one and number two for some people would be switched and I think probably a lot of people might disagree with my order of one and two but it's just my personal preference um, it's got even nothing to do with preference it's just to do with what it means to me and you've got to remember I'm 34 35 34 coming on 35 and so you know there are certain kind of LGBTQIA plus moments where I was young so it doesn't have that same impact and effect as maybe it would be for someone in their 40s. So, and I think I'm trying to just justify now why my number two is Dana International 1998. Now, okay, let's go right back to her winning. Now, I was 11, 12 at that point, um, and I remember um, I liked the song, now, whether I didn't know what trans was, like, I did grow up in rural England, in Devon, which is the bit that comes down there. Um, so, you know, I wasn't in and around cities like Brighton, Manchester, London, where maybe younger people were a bit more aware. Um, but I don't remember it was ever discussed that she was trans. Um, my parents definitely didn't say anything. I don't know if I knew what it was, to be honest, at that time. Um, but I don't remember it being discussed by the commentators either. The first time I know knew that she was trans was the day after in the media. Now, I remember my dad buys a paper, which I won't say its name. Um, it's an awful paper. And it was in there that she was trans. I didn't really understand it. And then, I still didn't really understand it then, kind of. I don't think I was naive, I don't think I got it. And then there was a documentary that the BBC um, aired of just her, her experience at Eurovision, pre, during and after. And it was explored in then about her, her, uh, her trans identity. I can say that, right? Trans identity. Um, and I was learning, I was, and I was like, wow, that's interesting. Um, and so at the time, that was pretty huge. Now, again, I was probably too young for it to properly register what that meant for the world. But I do remember, was it Eurovision 
2018 when Israel hosted, it was, or was it 19, Sugar Think Shane? I can't remember. But um, Asi Azar, one of the presenters who is LGBTQIA+, um, he said something pretty profound um, when he was presenting. I remember him saying, I've written it down, in 1998, I was 20 years old, so he's obviously older than me. Deep in the closet, a closet I thought I'd never come out of, but then Dana International, a young singer from Israel with an amazing voice and an unbelievable voice, and changed everything. Her victory helped millions of people around the world, including me, to feel comfortable with who they are. So this is what I'm saying. Two things here. I was obviously a bit too young for this to proper, proper register with me. But for someone like Asi, it wasn't. It was iconic. It was seeing someone on television being themselves and, and realising I can do that as well. I can be myself and be successful. And the second thing is visual representation of LGBTQIA+. Like, I'm sure that was the first time um, that people had seen a trans person. So how momentous is that? Um, it's incredible, like, and I can't say any more than that. Well, I can, I can say a lot of things. Like, I've seen her in interviews, she's just such an amazing mouthpiece for LGBTQIA plus um, rights, both in Israel and, and across the world. I mean, the fact she did what she did, despite the fact that basically the Orthodox Jewish community in Israel were basically seeking out her head, literally, and basically petitioning the Israeli government to basically intervene and not send this abomination to Eurovision to represent the state of Israel. And the fact that she went away and won is just absolutely incredible. I mean, the horrific things that were said about her that I've now found out from her own country is just insane. And the fact that she got up on that stage and performed like she did with that sort of context is crazy. And I kind of wrote down something else as well, which I found. Um, yeah, her victory transformed her into a national icon. She absolutely is. And that was no more kind of solidified when we saw um, Eurovision 2000. Is it Eurovision 2018, 2019? I'm in holiday mode, so my mind is not working. But, I mean, she was there and she was loved by the, the, the Israeli people. Yeah, my vi she said on her victory, my victory proves God is on my side. Because obviously she's going to Birmingham. It was Birmingham 1998. With basically the Jewish Orthodox community saying, you are not one of God's chosen people. You can't be if you decide to, to live that lifestyle and present that lifestyle to the world as a normal thing. And she's like, well, hold on a minute. I've just won a massive contest. God is obviously on my side. Um, I want to send my critics a message of forgiveness and say to them, try to accept me and the kind of life I lead. I mean, how bloody hard is that? This is what I don't understand. She's just asking people just to accept her. She's not asking anyone to embrace her or kind of, she's just saying, just accept me. Like, what is she doing or what has she done that is so bloody wrong? I am what I am and this does not mean I don't believe in God and I am, and I am a part of the Jewish nation. Love it. I mean, yeah. Take, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Like, She's just won a huge competition. Like, if you ever wanted to sign that God supports her, that was it. Um, but yeah, the last thing I'll say about Darling International, and I could go on forever, because I think she's amazing. <laughs> For me, she's obviously taken on a whole new meaning. Because obviously, <laughs> I'm a, I, w I keep on saying, I was young when she won, but obviously she's been in and around kind of the Eurovision circuit since she's won, and obviously since I've really followed it. Um, so obviously, her uh, kind of <laughs> return to Eurovision with Ding Dong, which I still think is one of my favorite Eurovision non-qualifiers. Um, no, concentrate. 2018, 2019, again, we're not sure when it was in Tel Aviv. My mind is not working. Um, I'm gonna say 2019. 
yeah, I'm going to go with 2019. Um, 2019. 2018. I'm, I keep changing my mind. Um, she sings um, as part of one of the interval acts, Bruno Mars, um, Just the Way You Are. And you see the, pa the camera pan to dozens of couples dancing together in the audience. Um, and she's basically saying to everyone in the audience, you are the way you are. You're just, you, you're perfect just the way you are. Um, and I just remember particularly seeing the faces and the, the selective shots of who they were kind of showing the audience. So I was like, bloody hell yes. And how amazing is that though? that Israel, we're finding out in 1998, yes, there's obviously the liberal aspect of Israel, like I said in regards to Turkey, but there's also extreme conservative side in Israel. There still bloody is. But the fact that, you know, this show that represents Israel, and, and every time a country hosts Eurovision, they host it in a way that they make sure that they host it to show their culture and their ideals and their values. And a huge part of the Tel Aviv show was embracing inclusivity. Um, so, yeah, full circle moment, I think. Um, so, yes. Okay, so that obviously means that number one um, should be pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> and that is uh, Conchita Borst, um, although, is it Conchita Borst now, or is it Thomas New Earth? Don't know, I need to check. Um, Austria's entry 2014, Rise Like a Phoenix, which was the Eurovision winner. Now, there are so many different reasons why this is kind of my number one biggest LGBTQIA plus moment. Um, now, I was aware of Conchita two years prior um, when she entered to represent Eurovision unsuccessfully for Austria with that's what I am. That's what I am. That's what I am. Pigeon. <laughs> um, an amazing song. Um, so I was aware of her then. So I knew about this bearded lady. And I started kind of following her. I was intrigued. Um, and then she just started becoming really successful in Austria. And she was just given the ticket, right? She didn't kind of have to go for another national final and they gave her a decent song rise like a phoenix um and i remember my friend i was living with my best friend at the time um and i had introduced him to conchita um prior to this because of that's what i am and so i was like oh my gosh austria's picked um conchita and this is her song and we were both just yeah really in love with it but i think we're more in love with conchita i will be honest I'm just saying, I don't listen to Rise Like a Phoenix on Spotify, but damn do I watch the performance on YouTube all the time. Um, it was the lead up to Eurovision, right? It was the fact that there was a lot of kind of drama around that entry. In Austria and outside of Austria, there, even the Austrian LGBTQIA plus community I was reading, kind of, they were saying that she gave, gives them a bad light or kind of bad representation or whatever. And, you know, there was even discussion, I think, in the Austrian parliament, I think, there seems to be a running theme sometimes, um, whether she should be sent to represent Austria. Um, it's 2014, it's not that long ago. Um, but it was the digs. So the, the most famous one is the guy from Armenia, right? The entry from Armenia. And that was one of the favourites that year. And he has his own TV show and he made some sort of dig at Conchita. And it really brought to the surface what I've now found out to be true, that in Armenia there is this kind of subtle and not so subtle homophobic attitude. Um, not by all, of course not, but it's there. Um, and he has his own show, and he compared her to um, members of the LGBTQIA plus community that, that hang out in a part of Armenia, I think. Uh, and he made some reference, like, if, if I saw her there, I'd show her a good time or something. It was disgusting. 
and she responded in a very eloquent way. I think she didn't rise to it. She just basically said, you know, you, you, what you've said is just not okay. Um, grow up, basically. And then, obviously, there were kind of conversations and discussions in countries like Belarus and Russia, no surprise, um, from social conservatives who basically tried to bring it up in Parliament or whatever they call their Parliament to basically say, you know, we can't we can't show this show. Um, they've got this freak, this abomination on stage, our poor children. Um, and this was all before the semi-final. Um, that, and that the, the Belarus and the, and the Russia thing was right up just before the semi-final, I remember it. Um, and I just remember watching that semi-final and the edge of my seat. I mean, if you look at the betting odds, she wasn't in and around being favourite. And it wasn't a guarantee that she was going to qualify. And I remember just watching it, just hang on her every word and like hit the note, hit, and she sung it absolutely perfectly um, and I was like oh that's definitely a qualifying position uh, performance amazing and basically good for you for people who have caught inside Austria and outside of Austria that's called you foolish disgusting etc etc um, I've just yeah I've, I had notes and I've just not even used them and just I just turned to something whereby it was stated either in Russia or Belarus that Eurovision has been turned into a hotbed of sodomy. Why do people care that much? <laughs> it just baffles me. Um, and yeah, and the final came around and I remember just how poignant and emotional that performance was. And it always stick out in my head. We. Um, we're very lucky. We've got a very good presenter. Um, we've been very lucky in the UK. We had Terry Wogan. <sighs> he could have retired slightly earlier. He did get to the point where everything that came out of his mouth was basically anti-Eurovision. But we've now got Terry Wogan, who has the wit of Graham Norton, who has the wit of Terry Wogan, but knows the line. I'm not one of these kind of Eurovision fans that are going to go to any forum and just start kicking off. Like, if people want to stag off, Eurovision, fine, I'm not going to get emotive about it, but Graham doesn't really do that, he's very good and um, at the end of that performance obviously there's a massive standing ovation in the final um, a huge standing ovation, because everyone knew that, there's, that it's more than just Conchita, it's more just the song, it is kind of, this is a message to the corners of the Eurovision map where just inclusivity is not there, or is in decline and um, and Graham Norton says, call me a sentimental old fool or something like that. But he said, watching that standing ovation in this moment, you realise that Eurovision means... Wi-Fi, okay? Wi-Fi's good. Thank you. Um, that Eurovision means something means something just a little or something like that. He's basically saying that we've just witnessed something historic here. And that's before the results came through or whatever. Um, and that that line just kind of sticks out to me. And then Kachita goes on to the BBC um, with her trophy, onto the Graham Norton show, a huge um, rating show. Lots of people tune in. Um, and he just said, he was like, when you won, like the whole stadium just stood up and um, the presenters of each, um, I, I doubt it, all of them <laughs> thinking about the type of countries that the presenters are there. But he was like, well, the, certainly the, the booths around him, everyone was standing up just roaring. And it was, mo it was more than Conchita in the song. It was, this, this is a victory for inclusivity. And I felt it in my front room. I was living just outside London that time and I felt it. I was like, that was special, um, because how much pressure was on Conchita, in all serious, or Thomas, whatever you want to call um, him, uh, how much pressure, because I'll be honest, I was backing Conchita because of these kind of anti-LGBTQIA plus sentiments and statements that were being said in and around. 
um, this entry. So I wanted that song just, I still didn't think that song was going to win. I think I was rooting for Sana Nielsen Undo that year from Sweden. I, wa I wanted Kajita to sing like she's never sung before. I wanted that song to be celebrated and do justice to the quality of the song, I guess. Um, but I never thought it was going to win. And I just remember when the results were coming through and when it won and um, what does she say at the end? Um, you know who you are. We are unity and we are unstoppable. Basically saying, not even just the LGBTQI plus community, but people who have been repressed, treated, treated different because negatively different because they're different like she's basically standing up saying look i've won this we are together we are unstoppable what an amazing message and a bit later obviously i'd followed the the whole conchita thing and um there was an interview um that was it and i saw it the other day actually but I didn't see the interview when I found the quote. I found the quote on a news thing, but I've now seen her say this. Um, Conchita, who wears a beard, is a statement that everyone deserves a fabulous life. Only grew stronger during the Eurovision campaign, calling out a fellow contestant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I thought I wrote more about it. She did this amazing speech about the beard and what the beard meant and, like, why does it bother people? Blah, 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 blah. But yeah, on that victory, I just remember the feeling of elation because it was more than just Austria winning, it was more than just Conchita winning, it was more than just the Rise of the Phoenix being the most voted song on the night, the song that had the most points. It seemed like a victory for inclusivity. It seemed like a victory for LGBTQI plus people. Um, that's why, for me, that's number one. And I know some people will put Dana International in as number one, and rightfully so, and I get that. Um, but that victory is a distant memory for me, and I, I completely understand the, how momentous that was at the time, Mosquito. Um, but Conchita is my Dana International moment. And yes, obviously, I was a bit older at that point. Um, so and she won at a time where there, there's lots of LGBT, there was lots of LGBTQIA plus uh, representation, um, but it was just the kind of that victory. And I'm not gonna name names, I'm not gonna name countries, I'm not gonna name groups, but that victory, the moment when she won and she kind of put that trophy up in the air and basically metaphorically putting her two middle fingers up to those people I am complete in solidarity with. I'm all about kind of forgiveness and love and whatever, but sometimes you just need to kind of have a little bit of victory. And that was victory. So yeah, that was my top 10. That's definitely longer than an hour, but hey ho. Um, and yeah, I've enjoyed researching and thinking and reflecting on my top 10 and it wasn't easy and things did change. I did have a few, <laughs> I did have other things in there that I wanted to talk about. Hobby stars made of stars from Israel, like had a bit of a, a, a yeah, a moment. Um, Germany's Lou, let's get happy. I remember, what's that, 2003? That's a great LGBTQIA plus anthem. Scooch flying the flag. I know some people will be, um, disgusted that that would be in my top 10 but for a lot of reasons that would make my top 10 but just didn't quite um but yeah so yeah those are my thoughts please let me know what you think um please let me know if um there's something that i've not said that is important to you um that counts as an lgbtqia plus moment and um until next time stay safe